Green Travel Agency, what can I do for you? Hi, good morning. My family and I intend to go on a vacation to Vancouver, and could you please help us reserve a hotel? The destination is Vancouver, so Vancouver has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Green Travel Agency, what can I do for you? Hi, good morning. My family and I intend to go on a vacation to Vancouver, and could you please help us reserve a hotel? Sure, with pleasure. First, I'll take some notes down of your personal details. May I have your full name, please? Anna Hardy. Hi, Anna. There is a hotel in Vancouver named Holiday Chilcotin, which is very popular with guests on vacation. Hmm, Chilcotin. Can you spell it? C H I L C O T I N. A local hotel. Where is it? Is it in the downtown area? You see, my family prefers to stay in a quieter zone during vacation. Not too busy, you know. Uh, no worries. Actually, it's ten miles from the city centre, near a train station. Oh, I think that's okay. I'm travelling with my husband. Is it expensive to stay in that hotel? Well, in your case, I think a double room would suit you well. Normally, it's two hundred and ten dollars. If you can make a reservation in advance, you can pay a hundred and sixty-nine dollars for a night. That sounds pretty reasonable. I'd like to book for five nights from the twenty-seventh of June through to the first of July. Are there still rooms available? Uh, let me check. Uh, yes, they have some vacant rooms. Would you like to book it now? Wait, one more question. Are any meals included in the price? Well, you need to pay separately for lunch and dinner, except the breakfast, which is provided from seven to nine. All right. Please book it for me. Is there anything we can do near the hotel? Yeah, it only takes ten minutes to walk to a science museum sponsored by the city council. Excellent. I think my husband will love it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Are there any outdoor activities to recommend to us? Because we don't want to stay in a hotel all day. Oh yes! If you like to go cycling, there is a shop near the hotel where you can rent a bike. Helmets are on sale, but you'll have to take your own boots. That sounds great. I think I'll do that. Also, it's a charming place for visitors who like to go mountain climbing. Oh, awesome! The hotel prepares two trips to a nearby mountain. One trip starts at nine in the morning, and the other one is at two in the afternoon each day. You can just call reception to make a reservation, and it's free of charge. But please be careful of fires, which are not allowed. If you like, you can go fishing in the lakes. For camping, a tent can be borrowed for a rest from the driver. Oh, I can't wait! It sounds like a lot of fun. If you'd like some adventure, you can go hiking in the forest. Sometimes you can even see some black bears. Be careful. Oh my God! I really do not like to take risks while travelling. One last thing: there is a visit to an ancient gold mine every afternoon. If you're interested, just call reception. I think we will do that. Thank you so much for your help. You're more than welcome. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear an introduction to a cycling holiday that the leader of a college campaign club is delivering to its members. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Right. Now let me bring you up to date with arrangements for our cycling tour next month. First of all, about the tents. You know, at the beginning, the idea was that I arranged to borrow some tents from the college, but it turns out they will be used by the hiking club at the same time. So I'm afraid you will have to bring your own. So. Do remember to tell me whether you prefer to use a single tent or share with others. In this case, I'll know how many tents there'll be when I make the reservation at the various campsites. Last time, some of you said you would like to hire bikes and pick them up when you arrive instead of taking your own. Well, I've asked lots of shops or agencies about bike hiring in St Andrews, the town where we'll be arriving, and unfortunately, there aren't any shops that offer this service. So, which I'm afraid. Means taking your own. I'll book them on the train when I book the train tickets. Which reminds me, I'll need to know the exact number of people going too, so that I can get a group discount on the train fare. Another one that'll need to be booked is tickets for the football match we discussed last time. I've inquired about availability, and there are only a few seats left. So anyone who wants to go will need to get tickets very soon, ideally today or tomorrow. At our next meeting, I'll be able to give you all individual packs with the final program, and something about the area we'll be cycling through and places we'll be visiting. I'm afraid I haven't had the time to do that yet. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Now I'll tell you briefly about some of the attractions in the places we'll be staying. As I said, we'll be taking the train to St Andrews, where there are one or two very good restaurants. One thing that's definitely worth visiting there is the sites where the original town was constructed nearly one thousand years ago. There's not much of the original buildings left, but there's still plenty to see. The site is being excavated, and you'll be able to help out if you want to. Our next overnight stop will be in the village of Cluny. There are a number of ancient barns here that have been modernised into a museum, indicating the significance of sheep in the area over the centuries. The wool used to be sold for cloth, and it, it brought riches to the district. There are also several photos describing how agricultural workers lived. From there, we'll leave for Penally. Penally is well known for its museum of village life, but that's being refurbished at the moment and isn't likely to reopen by the time we go there. But there is an open-air farmers market every day, selling fruits, vegetables, cheese, and meat, all grown or processed within a few miles of the town and sold by the farmers themselves. It's definitely worth a visit. In Varlo, which is one of the oldest towns in the region. There's a museum that shows how horses used to be the most universal way of travelling around, and how they were gradually substituted by steam, and later, of course, electric trains, buses, cars, and bicycles. Right now, I'll pass around this sheet of paper. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a tutor and his student called Helen discussing the anthropology project she is researching. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Come in, Helen. What can I do for you? Well, I'm doing research for the anthropology project, and I was hoping to ask for some help for a few details. Sure. I remember you opted for Pacific tapir cloth as the topic, didn't you? What did you figure out so far? Well, I was going to introduce my project by stating that tapir cloth. Is fiber made from bark, just the outer layer of the trees, which are particularly universal among the Pacific Islands, but not exclusive to them. Actually, people in other parts of the world have also produced high-quality cloth from bark. But what sets Pacific tapir apart is the incredibly varied role it plays in this region. Nice. So, what about raw materials that are used in the production? Well, tapir cloth is made from many species of trees. In the Pacific, the paper mulberry tree is most common, but it doesn't thrive in all conditions. In fact, it wasn't discovered in the islands at first, but was carried in canoes by the first migrants. Tapir is also made from the breadfruit tree, which is a more convenient way because its fruit is the staple food. The paper mulberry tree is only grown for tapir making mills. Yes, that's right. Then how about the Maori people here in New Zealand? Well, at present, the Maori don't produce tapir. Yeah, but I suggest you should take it into account. We know that when Maori migrated here from other Pacific islands, they were ready to produce tapir because they took the paper mulberry tree with them. The thing was, after they'd been in New Zealand a bit, they found the flax plant is superior to tapir because it makes stronger fabric. By the time Europeans arrived in the 18th century, Maori were producing all their fabric from flax rather than the tapir. And had been for some time. Okay, so in terms of the production process itself, first the inner bark is beaten with a wooden hammer to soften the fibers. Then the various pieces are glued together using adhesive paste made from the aloe root tuber, which is the only way to fabricate large pieces of cloth because bark strings are too fine to be woven together, and stitch isn't strong enough. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. So now you should do more research on the details about different countries. Where should I go into now? Well, I think Samoa is the typical place known for its sepal, which is hand painted with representations of the ancestors. Till now, at the most profound events in lives, such as births, funerals, weddings, and investiture of a chief. Some are with sepal ropes to add significance and eating to the ceremony. Okay, then I can talk about Tonga. It seems to me that the great innovation in Tonga has been developing a simple coarse cloth, which is quick and easy to produce. This is suitable for all sorts of daily functions around the house, like bed covers, nets, and curtains. Good point. Now, what about Cook Islands tapper? Well, the swelia is of poor quality. Consequently, the breadfruit tree is often used. One type of thick cloth called tikoda was wrapped around the poles and used to make the entrances to places of worship, and therefore was highly regarded in local culture. 
You might mention Fiji as well, which is interesting because tapa was actually used as currency there. Fijians used to sail between the islands and exchange tapa for other commodities like canoes or pigs. I know that in Tahiti the tapa cloth is regarded differently because the patterns are in colour, which is considered more valuable than the usual patterns. You're right about the Tahitians using coloured pigments, but they aren't more valuable. The colours are only decoration. People enjoy wearing bright robes, especially for dancing and competitive games, and do it just for fun. Oh, I'll take a note of that. Well, the last place I was going to mention was Tikopia. Even today, it's a common place to see wearing clothes made of tapa cloth. And on many of the other islands, the tapa only come out on special occasions. But here, you see people working in the gardens wearing tapa. Sounds promising, Helen. I'll look forward to the presentation of your project. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a biology freshman at a university presenting his research findings on the survival strategies used by butterflies. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. We were required to do the investigation regarding survival strategies of particular animals, and I chose to study how the butterflies will do for survival when cold weather and food shortage could easily influence their life cycle. I concentrated on a number of main strategies butterflies adopt to handle these harsh conditions: hibernation and migration. First, let's talk about the hibernation, which means a long-term sleep, in which an animal's metabolism slows to conserve strength. Various butterfly species have formed different patterns of hibernation at continuous periods of their life cycle. For example, the banded hair freak hardly hibernates in its full-grown adult form, but as an egg. And another species, the dappled white, breathes during the winter in a crystallized stage, and during this time. It's able to draw on the energy it stimulated earlier on in its larval stage. Though the slowing of the metabolism in hibernation functions with many of the difficulties faced in winter, it can't prevent them all. In addition, some butterflies have extra plans for survival. For instance, they develop a substance in their blood, usually in glycerol or sorbitol, which serves as antifreeze, thereby adding extra resistance against lower temperatures. Actually. There is a positive side to the cold weather. Fewer predators exist to cause problems. This is because they are mainly active in warm weather. So, now let's move on to the second type of survival strategy the butterflies used in winter: migration. That means moving to regions with a more suitable environment. I'm going to start this topic with a detailed study about particular cases of migratory species: the monarch butterfly. Many butterfly species found in various zones of the world migrate, like the red admiral, a British butterfly which winters in North Africa. But the monarch butterfly is the sole example to do this in North America. At any stage of the life cycle, the monarch cannot survive in the low winter temperatures. So when it gets cold, the monarchs begin to gather in huge groups and fly south. They can travel up to three and a half thousand miles. But only the last summer generation of monarchs migrate. Normal generations only live for a maximum of ten days. In fact, the last migration generation, as reported, do for six months, which enables them to take such a long journey. 
These huge teams of migrating monarchs only fly during daylight hours, and at night they usually have a rest in trees, again often in vast groups. Research is now being done into what encourages them to reach the destination. It has been known for years that they find their way on the journey by following rivers, and there are a few of these along the migratory route. However, the new research indicates that they may also treat the sun as a navigational aid. During this time, they are able to feed, mainly from a type of flower called milkweed, but they are not able to reproduce during this period. The monarchs hand in their lineage to a particular region in Mexico, known as the Pierre a Sequoia. The monarchs are anticipated with great interest within the region, and over recent years, their annual arrival has gained great popularity among tourists. However, their habitat is being increasingly threatened. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.